Vlad III, the Prince of Wallachia, is among a very rare club of people in human history who have transcended beyond real history and established themselves as a larger-than-life personality. But what did the Son of Dragon really do to earn the notoriety and infamy that has only grown with time and turned a mere man into a monster? Welcome to Nutty History. Today, let's find out if Vlad Dracul, the Prince of Wallachia, was truly the face of pure evil. The Bloody Lunch at Brusham In the second half of the 1450s, Vlad was at war with other cities of Transylvania, Brusha, and Sibiu. Sibiu was ruled by Vlad's own half-brother, and the other was ruled by Dan III, who was dreaming of snatching Wallachia from Vlad. These cities were heavily populated by the Saxons and not the native Romanian population. Not to be confused with Anglo-Saxons of the British Isles, the Transylvanian Saxons were German migrants who settled in the regions conquered by the Habsburg King of Hungary in the mid-12th century. They were prosperous merchants who boosted the economy of Transylvania and fortified several cities. Now, while native Romanians were mostly peasants who became inferior people in their own country after the Saxons gathered the wealth and favors of rulers, not to mention Saxons were Catholics and Romanians were Romanian Orthodox, another wedge that separated the two. When Vlad declared war on the Saxons, he dealt rather quickly with his half-brother and then laid siege at Brusha. Back then, Brusha was the heart of Transylvania with the richest coffers, the strongest army to defend a city, and a 14-foot thick wall supplemented with bastions spaced out strategically. The Saxon king of Brusha was sure that his city was safe. That indeed would have been the case if it weren't against Vlad. Vlad grew up in cities like this, and he knew them inside out. Vlad chose to attack at night and neutralize the city guard as he ransacked the surrounding suburbs. He wiped out the entire village of Bod and took several prisoners at Targoviste. The observer said that the people of Toms were shredded like cabbage and the village was set on fire. When the army moved out to douse the fire of burning places of worship, silos, and storage houses, Vlad was waiting for them. You can see where the myth of Dracula being the most powerful at night came from, can you not? The next day, Saxons were forced to send a diplomat to negotiate with Vlad, and when the diplomat arrived at Tom's, he must have imagined he stumbled into hell. Vlad was sitting among the 20,000 prisoners of war. These prisoners were suspended on stakes, a few of them were still alive, and the entire ground was crimson with the smell of iron in the air. The diplomat noticed that the stench of death was bothering Vlad's army as well, while the tyrant was calmly eating his food among the grove of corpses that he had created. One knight made the mistake of covering his nose and that offended Vlad. He asked his soldiers to put the knight on one of the stakes immediately along with the prisoners and they obliged. Vlad's enemies dug their own grave. Vlad sat there calmly, waiting for the diplomat as he ate his lunch alfresco style, dipping his bread in the cranberry juice he had mustered from the victims the night before. There was no negotiation, citing that before Vlad waged war, he had offered diplomatic reasoning to these cities but they ignored him so he wanted to make sure this time he wouldn't be ignored or taken less seriously. The man had learned cruelty from the best, but he took it to a whole nother level. When Vlad's father died in 1447, Sultan Murat himself delivered the news to the bitter young man and surprisingly released him on the condition that he joined the Ottoman army. He was asked to take Wallachia from John Hunyadi's puppet, Vladislav II, who were the Hungarians who had replaced Vlad's father as the ruler of Wallachia. Vlad wanted to rule Wallachia too as his birthright, but not under the thumb of the Sultan of the Ottomans. After defeating Vladislav once, Vlad defected to join Hunyadi's army. Surprisingly, Vladislav also switched sides to seek support from the Ottomans. What a switcheroo! After Hunyadi died in 1456, Vlad reached out to Hungarians and regained Wallachia with their support. Vlad caught up with Dan III, who was Vladislav II's brother, a year later after the siege of Russia. He made the deposed king dig his own grave while a priest read the burial mass for Dan and then Vlad put Dan in the grave and had his head lopped off. That just ain't right. That ain't right at all. On any level, that's just wrong. On his return to Wallachia, he put all Saxon merchants who were found circumventing his trade restrictions on the stake as well and had some boiled in a huge cauldron. The same fate befell 41 Saxon students simply because Vlad suspected them of being spies. No trial was needed. The Feasts of Blood and Fire Vlad's father's death was neither neutral nor an accident. His blunder to side with the Ottomans and then being wishy-washy about it earned him enemies in both Europe mainland and the Ottoman Empire. Vlad knew that there were a number of people responsible for his father's demise. 
Of course, the primary convict was Vladislav II, whom he had already usurped, but there was another prominent family with their hands stained with the blood of Vlad's father, the Boyers. The Boyers were an aristocratic ruling class in many parts of Eastern Europe, including Wallachia. Vlad knew that the Boyers would always be scheming to dispose of him, and he must deal with them before they strike. In 1457, on the occasion of Easter, he invited the entire Boyer clan in his principality for dinner at his castle in Targoviste. The 500 nobles gathered in their prince's great hall and were asked by Vlad how many princes they had seen in their lives. Some said seven, others said 20, a few chimed in with a number 30. He then raised his glass for a toast and declared that they wouldn't see each other anymore. The soldiers moved quickly to seize them. A few hours later, the entire court observed them being suspended on stakes and Vlad proudly called the scene, his art piece, the Sea of Rotting Corpses. They were left there on exhibition for a very long time as a warning. Vlad's cruelty didn't distinguish much between friends, foes, or subjects. If something bothered him, he knew only one way to take care of it. Another one of his infamous feasts involved ordinary Romanian peasants instead of noble political rivals. On an occasion, Vlad invited a large group of local people who have been variously described as old, lame, or beggars. He lavished his unsuspecting guests with a feast and they ate and drank long into the night. The prince then locked the diners inside the hall and told his guards to set the building on fire. Looking at his work, he remarked, these men live off the sweat of others, so they are useless to humanity. In general, Vlad loved to incinerate things in people, sort of living up to his title, the son of Dracula. He also had a morbid sense of humor as he enjoyed using extreme tickling as a method of torment, along with laying the skin of the soles of the victim's feet. Oh man, not the feet. The Forest of Stakes Six months after the death of Dan III, Vlad brokered a biased peace with the Saxons, knowing very well that the Ottomans would soon be knocking on his door, and he didn't want to compromise his position by having a fight on two fronts at once. Until 1459, Vlad had paid the Ottomans a hefty annual tribute of 10,000 ducats to keep them happy as he dealt with Saxons, but once the peace happened, he stopped paying the Ottomans. In 1462, Sultan Mehmet sent his ambassadors to collect the arrear of three years along with the demand of 500 young boys for the Ottoman army as the penalty. When the ambassadors proudly reiterated the Sultan's demands with very little respect for Vlad, the prince reminded them that they were in his court and should not have addressed it without taking off their turbans. Given that they prioritized their turbans over showing respect to him, he ordered his soldiers to nail the turbans into the ambassador's skulls so they may never be able to take them off, ever. Before the news of his ambassador's fate reached Sultan Mehmed, Vlad moved quickly and captured the Ottoman city of Jerju. He dusted off his Ottoman general's armor and colors to pose as one. He spoke fluent Turkish to make Jerju guards open the gate for him. What followed was exactly what you would expect from Vlad the son of Dragon. His army began laying down fire on the fortress as Wallachian generals gathered the Ottoman officials of the fortress. Vlad asked his guards to push the heads of arrested officials into the cauldrons of hot oil until they were dead. Soon. Vlad continued his offense along the villages near the Danube, decimating every piece of Ottoman settlement in his way. Now, what would you do to Vlad to protect your village? Enraged, Mehmet sent 60,000 men armed with a plethora of advanced weapons to invade Wallachia. Vlad had only 24,000 men at his disposal, so open combat was out of the question. He had to come up with another way to send the Ottomans back. As Ottomans moved towards Targoviste, Vlad surprised them first with guerrilla warfare an ambush at night that cost the Ottomans a grand total of 5,000 casualties. But after the surprise came the shocker. When the Ottoman army arrived at the outskirts of Targoviste, they witnessed fields burned down as far as the eye could go. But these weren't empty fields. Instead of crops, the fields were populated with stakes, and those stakes had 20,000 people on them. The Ottoman army realized that these people weren't Wallachians, but Ottomans. Vlad had gathered every Ottoman he could find in Wallachia and mass eliminated them simply as a warning, without any regard for the victim. The mile-long semicircle of death spooked the Ottomans so hard that they immediately retreated their forces. The Origin of Bloodthirst Vlad III of Wallachia is, and perhaps always will be, a controversial figure in the annals of history. On one hand, for many people of Romania, he is a national hero, the scourge of the relentless Ottoman Empire that exploited the people of Wallachia and Moldavia the two principalities that formed the modern nation of Romania. But for many Romanians and people from other parts of the world, Vlad the Impaler was a terrible, bloodthirsty, and unhinged tyrant whose cruelty didn't differentiate between friend and foe. Was he born a madman with a penchant for stakes? 
Well, let's just say it is much more likely that he turned out that way thanks to the Ottomans. Vlad III's father, Vlad II Dracul, got his surname after his induction into a Christian crusading order known as the Order of the Dragon. But this success was short-lived. When the Hungarian general of Wallachia, John Hunyadi, counterattacked and began pushing the Ottomans back, Vlad II tried to act like he had nothing to do with the Ottomans. Not the wisest move, of course. Sultan Murad grew suspicious of Vlad II's loyalty and invited him to stay with him at Gallipoli. After everything, Vlad knew that declining the Sultan's invitation when he was already pissed would not be in the best interest. It was a gamble to accept the invite, and the Vorvo decided to bite the bullet. As soon as he arrived at the city gates of Gallipoli, he was arrested along with his two younger sons, 14-year-old Vlad III and 7-year-old Radu the Handsome. Quite a name, Radu the Handsome. While the father was released after a year, the two kids spent six years with the Ottomans. While young Radu was obedient and listened to the Ottomans like his own family, Vlad III was already a teenager, and that young rebellion spirit was alive and kicking. Before being captured by the Ottomans, Vlad had spent his childhood at Syasora among the Hungarian royalty. He received a first-class education on how to be a prince around people who believed that they were the descendants of Spartans and thus made their royal children act like they were in a Zack Snyder movie. Vlad was made to stand outside in storms, hunt hares with his bare hands, shoot down eagles with slingshots, and ride unsaddled horses by the age of five. The house where Vlad spent his childhood in Hungary is now a gaudy-themed restaurant called Casa de Dracule. The building overlooks the councilman square in Sayasora, which once was a small jail when Vlad lived there. He often observed prisoners being dragged from the prison to jeweler's dungeon. Do you think Vlad was born insane or did the Ottomans bring it out of him? Tell us in the comments if you would like us to create more videos like this. And please do share, like, subscribe, and ring the bell to support us.